Thus, one might say that this institution is not only a university in Zion, but is in the process of becoming a Zion University. Brothers and sisters, I'm grateful to be with you today. As I walked in, Elder Eyring was at the door and we came in together. I said, I didn't expect you here. And he said, I'm here to support you. And I said to him, do you realize that when I'm assigned to speak in the tabernacle, that I don't worry about the 6,000 in front of me, I'm concerned about the 15 behind me. <laughs> but faculty and students, Elder Eyring, I'm pleased to be with you today. What a great opportunity. For many years, I have been observing the great miracle that the Lord is performing on this earth as he builds a Zion people in country after country. In July 1956, I traveled as a missionary from Salt Lake City to London to begin a mission for the church. There were no stakes. In fact, the number of stakes in the total church were only 265 then, with six of them outside the western U.S. and Canada. There were 15,000 members of the church in Great Britain living in about 15 districts. Upon completion of the mission two years later, there were 16 districts, but still no concentration of saints in the British Isles large enough to organize a stake. In 1971, I returned as an employee of an American company. A few stakes existed in the British Isles by then, but the bulk of the saints were still scattered and met in small congregations. My family lived in a small village and attended a branch 35 miles away. Our first Sunday in sacrament meeting, there were 14 in attendance, and seven of them had the name of Bateman. We met in a small schoolhouse with many members driving many miles to attend. Twenty-three years have passed since our family returned home, and the small seeds planted by the miracles and others since World War II have turned into a miracle. Two years ago, I returned to Great Britain on church business and learned that there were more than 40 stakes with more than 160,000 members of the church. With all of England, every parcel of ground now within the boundaries of a stake. Since my call as a general authority in 1992, I've learned that the British experience is not unique. As late as 1963, there were no stakes in Brazil. On a recent trip to San Paulo, the area presidency informed us that the 150th stake would be formed before the end of 1995. The growth in Chile, Argentina, Peru, Mexico, the Philippines, and many other countries are similar to Brazil. In early 1970, there were no stakes in Japan. Today, there are 25. In 1973, there were no stakes in Korea. Today, there are 16. In 1978, I was called by President James E. Faust, who then was president of the International Mission of the Church, to accompany Elder Ted Cannon on a fact-finding mission to West Africa. The call came just after the priesthood revelation was received. Although numerous groups in Ghana and Nigeria were expressed interest in the church at that time, there were no more than a hundred members of the church in all of that part of the world. West Africa membership today totals more than 70,000, and there are stakes throughout the region. The prophets Daniel and Isaiah saw our day. Daniel stated, and in the last and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Isaiah likened the church to a tent and said that in the last days it would cover the earth by lengthening its cords and planting and strengthening stakes. How is this done? 
How are the hearts and minds changed so that conviction and commitment exist in people's souls? What role does Brigham Young University play in this marvelous venture? With regard to the transformation occurring in the hearts and minds of men and women, I have learned that the great miracle of the church is based on thousands and thousands of small miracles quietly occurring across the earth. May I illustrate with two examples. Four weeks prior to Elder Cannon's and my trip to West Africa in July 1978, 50 letters were sent to members and non-members in the various countries apprising them of our visit and asking them to meet us at the airport upon arrival. During a four-week period, we visited eight cities in four countries. With the exception of one city, no one received a letter in time to meet us. Toward the end of the trip, we arrived in Calabar, Nigeria. On a Friday afternoon, needing the services of one previously identified member to help us find approximately 15 congregations in the southeastern part of that country. Each congregation had adopted the name of our church, and the leaders had written asking for information and for missionaries. The member, Ime Edwak, was not at the airport. Brother Cannon and I took a taxi from the airport to the hotel, checked in, and went up to the room to deposit our bags. We did not know what to do. We knelt down in the room and asked God to help us find Ime Edwak. We needed him for the next two days to help us find those groups that wanted to know about the church. We were in a city of one million people with no street addresses and no telephone books. We returned to the lobby of the hotel, went to the city to the desk clerk, asked if she knew Ime Edwak, like asking someone at the Marriott Hotel in Salt Lake City if they know John Smith. She did not. Within a few minutes, a large number of Nigerians had gathered around us discussing our plight, but lacking the information needed. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned to see a large man standing next to me who said, Did I hear you say Ime Edwak? He's my employee. I'm on my way home from work and for some reason stopped at the hotel to buy a newspaper. He's just moved. He will be leaving the office in 15 minutes. If you don't get there in time, you won't find him this weekend. He put us in a taxi, gave the driver instructions. We arrived at his office just as Ime Edwak was locking the door. Brother Edwak guided us to each congregation during the Saturday and Sunday that followed. Many people in those congregations are now members of the church and information gleaned from them formed an important part of the report given to the First Presidency upon our return. The second incident comes from a story told by Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve. Svetlana was a beautiful young Russian woman living in Leningrad, what is today called St. Petersburg. She had importuned the Lord in prayer to make it possible for her to obtain a Bible written in her native language, Russian. The year was 1989, and such a Bible was rare and very expensive. In the fall of that year, she and her family went to Helsinki searching for a Bible. While walking through a park in Helsinki, she stepped upon an object hidden beneath the ground cover of autumn leaves. She stooped down, spread the leaves, and found a book. 
She picked it up and found it to be the answer to her prayers, a Bible written in Russian. So excited was she that she joyfully recounted the story to another woman who was also in the park. The second woman asked Svetlana, Would you like to have another book about Jesus Christ, also written in the Russian language? The Finnish woman, wife of a district president, provided Svetlana with a copy of the Book of Mormon and invited her to church. Svetlana took the missionary lessons, joined the church, and returned to Leningrad with her family. She then invited friends into her home, and many of them responded to the message of the missionaries and were baptized. Svetlana, her friends, and others like them are the pioneer foundation upon which the church has been built in that part of the world. Why was a Nigerian with vital information prompted to deviate from his normal course and stop at a hotel to buy a newspaper? How did a rare, expensive Russian Bible find its way into a Finnish park, coincident with a, the passage of a Russian woman who had been praying for such a prize? How did the wife of a Finnish district president just happen to be in the park to share in the joy of her find? Brothers and sisters, who is guiding the church? We live in a day when hundreds of thousands of small miracles are quietly occurring as the Lord prepares the honest in heart for entrance into his kingdom. What role does Brigham Young University play in the process? The answer depends on our testimonies and how we view the university in its relationship to the church. Is the university apart from or a part of the church. Following the announcement of my appointment as president of Brigham Young University, the Salt Lake Tribune carried an article on what it means to have a general authority as the school's leader. I was interested. The major point of the article concerned the university's relationship to the church. The news reporter suggested that although some might have assumed prior to the announcement that the university was a secular institution distinct from but reporting to the church, the call clearly indicates that the university is an integral part of the kingdom. The article surprised me in that I had never thought of Brigham Young University separate from the church. Prophet after prophet has stated clearly that Brigham Young University is a religious institution with a divine mission, even though secular education is a key part of its purpose. Given the organizational structure by which the university is governed, it seems paradoxical that some might think that Brigham Young University is not an integral part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The church itself is an educational institution, and Brigham Young University is one of its key components. Thus, one might say that this institution is not only a university in Zion, but is in the process of becoming a Zion University. From the very beginning, education has been one of the central missions of the church. The School of the Prophets, established in Kirtland, Ohio in 1833, foreshadowed the creation of the University of the City of Nauvoo in 1841. The purpose of the Nauvoo School, as stated by the prophet Joseph and his counselors, was to teach our children wisdom, to instruct them in all knowledge and learning, in the arts, sciences, and learned professions. Speaking of the university in Nauvoo, the First Presidency then said, We hope to make this institution one of the great lights of the world, and by and through it to diffuse the kind of knowledge which will be for the public good and for personal and individual happiness. The prophet Joseph's dream to build a university that would become a light to the world was cut short by a mob's bullet on June 27, 1844. But the dream burned deeply inside another prophet. Brigham Young taught, ours is a religion of improvement 
Every art and science known and studied by the children of men is comprised within the gospel. In February 1850, only two and a half years after the first wagon train entered the Salek Valley, the University of Deseret was created, the first institution of higher learning west of the Mississippi, and a testimony to the value placed on education by the Latter-day Saints. Brigham Young University was founded in 1875 by the prophet whose name it bears. It has become the flagship of the church's educational system. It is becoming the light to the world that Joseph foresaw and through which knowledge is and will be diffused for the public good and personal happiness. Let us now explore what it means for Brigham Young University to be a church entity, a Zion University. As almost everyone knows, the word Zion in Latter-day Saint literature refer refers to the pure in heart, or the place where the pure in heart dwell. As Zion people are of one heart and mind, they dwell in righteousness and have no poor among them. The word university originally meant a community, but it also is used to mean cosmos or totality. In our context, a Zion University is a community of righteous scholars and students searching for truth for the purpose of educating the whole person. They understand that God's children are more than intellect and body. The intellect is housed in a spirit, which must also be educated. Sacred or higher truths relating to the spirit are the foundational truths in a Zion community and center on Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, the sacrificial lamb who gave his life for the sins of the world, the first fruits of the resurrection. Community members also have full faith in the appearance of the Father and the Son to the prophet Joseph in a vision in a grove of trees. That other angelic visitors also appeared to him that the gospel and holy priesthood were restored to the earth following a long period of apostasy. They know that the Book of Mormon is what it purports to be, and that revelation from God to his prophets is the guiding instrument of the church. But we must also remember that as a university, there is a prime obligation to teach secular truth. Our goal is to achieve excellence in this sphere. There must be no alibi for failure to achieve a first-class rank within the parameters set by the Board of Trustees. Continual improvement of faculty qualifications and performance is the key to this objective. Faculty turnover in the next few years will be high, but I am convinced the prospective faculty with the proper credentials have been and are being prepared. Because the gospel is the common denominator at this university, and since all truth is part of the gospel, every subject must be taught with testimony. Testimony is not to be encased in particular institutions on campus. Brigham Young University is not the Harvard of the West or the Stanford of the Rocky Mountains with an institute of religion on the periphery. We have the opportunity to be better at discovering and teaching truth, all truth, because testimony can be everywhere and permeate everything. Testimony and the Holy Spirit have as much to do with English and mathematics as with religion. If we are diligent in scholarship and obedient to the principles. Teachers and students in this community should understand that all truth is spiritual, and thus the so-called secular truths may be discovered by revelation as well as by reason. Arthur Henry King, a great Shakespearean scholar at this university 20 years ago, understood the process of revelation and the discovery of secular truth. In a forum speech in 1972, he related the following. Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist, Nobel Prize winner, is reported to have said that he owed his discoveries more than anything else to the reading of Shakespeare. That may seem odd, unless we have read recently that apparently frivolous book called The Double Helix about the discovery of the form of a genetic molecule by a young American. He tells exactly what happened during the days when he progressed towards that discovery. It is worth reading to realize that great discoveries in science 
like great writing, ultimately come from, call it what you like, intuition? I would call it inspiration. Brother King then concluded, the wind apparently bloweth where it listeth, but can anything worthwhile happen on any university campus with which the Holy Ghost is not involved? My favorite story illustrating, illustrating the role of the Holy Ghost in the light of Christ in the discovery of secular truth comes from James W. Cannon, a member of our mathematics department. He was a professor at the University of Wisconsin at the time. He was trying to determine how to unknot an infinitely knotted object in high dimensional space. After pushing the problem around for many months with no success, the solution came in an unexpected manner. He records, one night at 2 a.m., my eyes suddenly popped open. I sat up in bed. I knew how to extend Stanko's techniques. I do not know how the answer came to me. I couldn't sleep. I dressed quietly and went walking on the dark streets of Madison. I checked the ideas for all of their consequences. I checked for absurdities. I couldn't find any. The picture was wonderful. Brother Cannon's experience is not unusual. After studying, puzzling, and dreaming about a problem, scientists often find progress stopped. Then suddenly, as if out of nowhere, a flash of light comes. Secular truth is revealed by the spirit as well as by reason. May I now say a few words to the faculty, staff, and administration, although I expect the students to listen as well, because it has application in your lives. A Brigham Young University appointment is a sacred trust. More than 27,000 youth of the church selected on the basis of gospel commitment and scholarship potential are under our stewardship. Consequently, we have responsibility to nurture their faith and improve their academic skills. The great majority of us are members of the LDS Church, and the prime requisite for employment is a personal testimony and behavior consistent with the restored gospel. Non-member faculty and staff are expected to live according to the light within them and standards agreed upon at the time of employment. Placing commitment to gospel truths first in the life of a faculty member does not demean the second requirement of academic excellence. If testimony and high personal standards are the foundation, outstanding scholarship, which includes teaching ability, is the capstone. Both testimony and scholarship are essential for this university to achieve its destiny. They are not competitive, but complementary. The new administration is committed to academic excellence. The desire for excellence covers graduate studies and research in selected areas, as well as continued improvement of teaching at the undergraduate level. In particular, we believe that the teaching quality must be improved in some key areas and will be working with the faculty to accomplish this. A personal commitment to gospel standards by faculty members will increase, not decrease, academic freedom. If applied, the gospel framework will keep us from gathering like flies hovering over dead carcasses of secular error. As a close faculty friend pointed out to me recently, the greatest limitation on academic freedom comes when faculty take for granted the assumptions employed by colleagues at other institutions in their development of secular theories. We will be more productive and enjoy more freedom if we examine and test secular assumptions under the lamp of gospel truth. We must not blindly accept the choices made by others. These statements obviously apply more to the social sciences and humanities than to the physical sciences engineering the professions. However, even scholars in those areas would do well to measure the worth of their scholarship in the gospel light. A brief illustration is in order. In speaking of the last days, Isaiah and Nephi indicate that people will call evil good and good evil. 
will put darkness for light and light for darkness. We'll put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Recently, I learned about a movie that was described by a newspaper critic as wonderful, joyous. It was rated PG-13. The film features seven illicit relationships, including open marriage, fornication, and adultery. The main messages of the film are, first, open marriages are acceptable. Second, it is appropriate for men to abandon their wives and families if they become stressed. Third, illicit relationships relieve grief and do no harm if secrecy is maintained. And fourth, premarital sex is normal. To a committed Latter-day Saint, the film is not wonderful or joyous. It is sad and depressing. As evil is called good again and again. There is a stark contrast between the messages of the film and the recently issued proclamation on the family by the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve. There are scholars in this university who study the family. There are classes taught in a number of disciplines which relate to the family. If scholarship and teaching at this university are based on the proclamation standards rather than the world standards, academic freedom will increase and students will be spiritually strengthened to withstand the onslaught of evil, theories and practices that the world calls good. A society that is in moral decline is also in intellectual decline, for the one surely follows the other and follows fast. The grass is not greener on the other side of the fence. What may appear to be limits on academic freedom derived from the religious nature of the institution provides additional freedoms. It is imperative that we not mimic the research and teaching choices of our colleagues at, the, uh, at other universities without first using the measuring rod of the gospel. I believe that we have the finest faculty and staff assembled in the, assembled in the world when one uses the Lord's measuring stick. It is clearly the strongest faculty and staff ever assembled at Brigham Young University. I firmly believe that the Lord will strengthen the faculty in the process of time. Finally, may I now speak to the students. May I paraphrase an earlier president of Brigham Young University. Our reason for being is to be a university, but our reason for being a university is the students. Last Sunday evening, as I watched many of you at the CES devotional with President Faust, I could tell that you have testimonies. For more than 120 years, this campus has had a distinctive character. Strangers who visit are struck by the cleanliness and orderliness of the buildings, the grounds, and especially the people. Although dress and grooming standards may not seem as important as other parts of the honor code, they help us be as distinctive people. I remember visiting other college campuses during the 1970s while serving as a faculty member at this university. It was the height of the hippie period when long hair, drugs, sloppy clothes, and rebellion were the order of the day. It was so refreshing to return to this campus. This, and when we returned to see the clean young people and feel the peace that prevailed here. This administration is committed to preserving that atmosphere. We ask you to live by your word of honor regarding the dress and grooming standards. A few may be uncomfortable and may not want to abide by them. For those few, please have the intellectual courage and integrity to live the standards or depart peacefully and try another institution. As I mentioned last Sunday evening, as I watched many of you at the devotional, I could tell that you are not doubters, but seekers after truth. You recognize the Spirit. Many of you have experienced an epiphany, as described by President Faust, in that flashes of insight and testimony have come to you at critical times. Many of you have seen the manifestations of divine power. You have made covenants. You've been able to call heavenly power forth in your own lives. 
you understand that age is not a prerequisite for communing with the Lord and through his Holy Spirit. May I share with you, in closing, a flash of insight given me by the Spirit 20 years ago, in which I learned about this university's major role in building the kingdom? It concerns you, the students, but also the faculty. The Bateman family had just returned to Provo from the East Coast following my appointment to be dean of the School of Management. We had been away for four years with the multinational corporation and had enjoyed ourselves immensely. Although we knew the decision to return to Brigham Young University was correct because prayers had been answered, I was still struggling emotionally with a new assignment. In September 1975, we attended the first multi-stake fireside of the school year, similar to the one held last Sunday evening. We were sitting high up in the Marriott Center near Portal C. As the speaker began his sermon for the evening, I looked out across the congregation. It must have totaled 18,000 or more, including all of the missionaries from the MTC. They were easy to spot because they were allowed to take off their coats. They were sitting in near Portal M. It was just a sea of white. Approximately 2,500 white-shirted missionaries filled that section. I looked at them. And I began thinking about what would happen to them in the next three to four weeks. I realized that they would be scattered to the four corners of the globe. It was exciting to contemplate the people they would serve, the change that would occur in the missionaries as they matured spiritually, and the miracles that would bring new members into the church. Then a flash of inspiration opened my mind's eye as to the purpose at Brigham Young University. I realized that 27,000 students were being prepared to enter the world. Every year, approximately 6,000 would leave Provo and scatter across North America with some going to Europe, others to Asia, some to Africa, and a number to South America. Some might even go down under. If the university performed its roles well of deepening spiritual roots and providing a first-class education, in the course of time, strong church families would grow up in hundreds and thousands of communities all over the world. These BYU families would be waiting when later missionaries arrived. My earlier experiences in London Boston, Colorado Springs, High Wycombe, Lancaster, Bedminster, Accra, and Lagos had pointed to the importance of just one or two strong families to form a core upon which the Lord could build a branch, then a district, and finally a stake. The BYU families would be good neighbors, have strong relationships with work associates, and if well-trained, be leaders in their communities. These strong families, by example and invitation, would open doors for missionaries' dinner. I then knew why we had returned to the university. It provided a satisfying feeling on the journey home that evening. Students leaving the university with a first-rate education combined with spiritual strength, based on faith in Christ and this restored gospel, have a tremendous advantage in the world. You know who you are. You need not be afraid. Faculty members should know that their teaching and research are building something of great worth. Brigham Young University is a major contributor to the central mission of Christ's kingdom on the earth. I testify, brothers and sisters, that this institution will not fail. As Daniel prophesied, the kingdom will not be left to other people. Joseph's and Brigham's vision that the spiritual can be combined with the secular without the latter overcoming the former will prove true because of faith, testimony, and priesthood power. 
Brigham Young University will be a light to the world, dispensing truth for the public good and for individual happiness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.